So 12th World Usability Day, and we're really excited because the topic this year is really near and dear to my heart, and this is why I'm here. Usually I'm in the audience, and this time I just couldn't help it. I said, okay, I'm just going to do a little tiny intro, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, our guest presentations. And I'm very excited to have my colleagues from the Faculty of Computer Science um, share their research with us today. The, uh, the topic is uh, design for good or evil. And in these days, we can't tell what the truth is. Social media is everybody's taking up everybody's time. It's a really frightening time, actually, to be living for, I don't know, more senior people in this room. Um, and a lot of what we are actually experiencing and maybe are afraid of or potentially damaging uh, is completely guided by technology. And a lot of the technology that we are being driven by, say, I don't know, our social media that sucks our time and creates dependencies and provides us with the, with the rewards that we need by design, all of that is, is really, I think, part of the topic of today's event. So of course, I, that's why I'm, I was so uh, motivated to come up here and share some of my thoughts about it. So I'll be brief. and. Um, the World Usability Day starts with the concept of usability. And in my class, I've been teaching computer science and user experience now for about oh, close to 20 years. And um, we often start with definitions. So this is the academic part of the presentation. So what is usability? I often force my students to give us suggestions. So anybody want to contribute their definition of usability or words that come to mind when you think of usability. I'm not going to look at the students who've been in my class and have been drilled on that already. I'm looking at the other people who haven't spoken yet. Ease of use. Ease of use. Thank you, Camilo. Anybody else? Call them out. You don't have to raise your hand. Just say it. Discoverability, okay. Low friction. Low friction, I like that. Anybody else? Learnability. Learnability? Effectiveness, efficiency. Somebody's read the definition recently? Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Accessible. Accessible, nice. Okay, all those and more. Uh, this is our definition from the source of all, I think Wikipedia. Um, but it's based on the ISO standard definition of usability. And the, the adjectives there are effectiveness, efficiency, satisfaction, with, the, uh, with which the users can achieve tasks in a particular environment of a product, which means it's not everybody doing everything, because we're not trying to do that. So my mother is not going to fly a plane, and neither am I for that matter. But I should be able to go to an ATM machine and use it without any problem. So should my mother. She doesn't have the courage maybe to do it. She still doesn't, and she doesn't have the need. So then how do we make that machine more accessible so that she can actually do it with confidence and make it as appealing as walking and talking to the teller? Is that even possible? So um, and high usability uh, has issues and topics like ease of learn, efficiency, visually pleasing, quick recovering from errors. So yeah, I lied. It's not from Wikipedia. but. We could easily have gone to Wikipedia and got similar information. Uh, the goals of usability, as, we, as this is straight out of the textbook that I use in my course, are the functionality, the effectiveness, efficiency, again, safety is a good one, and memorability, that's another one, right? The second time I go to use a system, I should be able to do it more easily than the first. Especially if we're talking about things, say, doing your taxes, which you do once a year, things that are not frequent. How memorable is it? How, how many, or changing clocks. Let's talk about changing clocks this week. Like how many of us have to go to a manual to figure out how to change the clocks on all the devices that are, that are in our lives, which are not automatically changing. Like your car, for example. My car does not automatically change. And so those skills, how usable are the systems? Can we remember from one round to the next that we, how to actually do that? And so in my class, what we do is we talk about examples of good and bad design. 
and I force the students to come up with examples and they bring them and we share them. So I'm just gonna share some with you, some examples from my collection of things that I think are pretty uh, memorable and, and easily um, appreciated. So this is a form, this is a real form, which says, click here to clear the form. This is a, a true replica of a form of a, a company that Diane, you and I both worked at. And it's a real example from a, a broadcast company that's based in Canada. I will say no more. <laughs> and this is a true example from the early days, but still, there was, there was a desire to explain what a button does. And I'm sure everybody in this room who looks at that form now, of course, you're very select audience here, you're not just people, the average people off the street. But you can predict what the outcome of this is going to be and how satisfied the users will be in most cases, at least the first time that they remember the error that they commit on that application form. Another really great example, this is a, this is a button that was um, at the top of a process that was um, implemented by one of the leading financial institutions in this country. And it costs a lot of money and a lot of effort. And when they put it on your banking homepage and you went to do your banking, people did not <coughs> press that button. Can you imagine why that might be the case? How many of you would press that button? How many of you think that that button says aggravation? How many of you are afraid if you press that button, something bad's going to happen? Okay. So that organization went to a lot of trouble to implement a new f functionality, which is actually, if I tell you, imagine if you could see all your financial information in one place, regardless of institutions. So all your credit cards from different banks, all your investments, your car loans, your student loans, your, your, your savings and checking accounts from all of your institutions in one place. Wouldn't that be a cool place? I think they call that Mint now. <laughs> but in those days, this was revolutionary and it was done by a bank. And this was the button and people didn't use it. Again, another usability kind of example. And this speaks to the fact that we all, when we live in our financial institutions or wherever it is that we happen to be working, whatever our subject matter expertise that we develop in our jobs or in our lives, we become skewed. I always talk about the keyhole that was on the cover of, of my slide deck. The keyhole we developed in talking about uh, financial institution in this case. We use the word aggregation in every meeting morning tonight and we call the project by that name. And so of course, when it comes to naming the button, in those days, it seemed like the natural thing to do. Now we know better because we have something called research. And if we do our research, we will know that that's not a good label for a button and we would do a better job. Because actually when they changed the t title of the button to my money, it suddenly became popular. Very simple solution. Another usability challenge, which we all experience, is the complexity of enjoying passive media. And in this case, it's television remotes when we actually, we have all this control at our fingertips, yet what we really need is this. And especially if we get older and we're, we're familiar and we don't really need all those other controls. Another example of bad design, which this was actually on the World Usability Day website, and I thought I'd bring that to our attention here. The gear shift was um, Chrysler, and people died because they did not know when they, their car was put in park and the car would roll and this device did not provide sufficient feedback because it didn't have, um, well, it didn't, probably didn't have enough, the audio warning that they were giving, you know, all those beeps that happen when you open the car door, well, how do you distinguish the right beep from the wrong beep? Do any of you remember the, the door is ajar? Did any of you have that car? that said the door's ajar. It's like, what's a jar? <laughs> um, so bad design is surrounding us everywhere. And 
those ni the nice list of usability terms that we had before live in the circle of what I call user experience, which we all call user experience now. But usability is just one of the many terms in the user experience. So user experience gets to be a lot more complex. There's all these other adjectives like uh, valuable. So yeah, we know how to push that button, but do we want to? And credible. So I can I can bring all my money and my business to your institution on this website that you make it very easy for me to do, but do I trust you enough to do that, to push the pay button and give you my personal information? Credibility is a really huge component of that. And very often, product designers don't, cons again, they're sitting in their keyhole of their product and they're assuming people are just gonna come there because they have a product, but that's of course not how it works. And then there's another circle outside of that, which is customer experience, because of course, not everybody's gonna be a user of our system. Sometimes people who buy our system are not our users, but they're our stakeholders and they're people in the decision-making process. And we need to understand and distinguish those. And then there's many examples of all those levels. So we have the uh, Ticketmaster that was recently in, in the news where they showed concert, concert ticket prices from face value to scalper values. And then they showed that it was a CBC story that uncovered that Ticketmaster had decided to get in the business because look at, the, look at the margins between the actual ticket price and the scalper price. Why would you leave all that money on the side if you're a Ticketmaster? They have really nice houses in Los Angeles, the people who work there. And here's what they did to get into the business. They decided to take advantage of it by changing the pricing model of the tickets so that they're dynamically actually, they're releasing small numbers of tickets and batches and the prices changes every time the batch gets released. And then they now welcomed the scalpers into their platform to sell through their own platform. So that somehow miraculously, all the tickets would disappear and they actually supported the scalpers creating fake accounts and, sell, and, and automatically creating robots and, and uh, clearing the ticket inventory out and then providing it back to, to the main public at hugely inf inflated prices and then Ticketmaster benefiting from just one concert over half a million dollars of the benefit of, of uh, the extra fees on resale of the tickets. How is that for your customer experience? Some of you are sitting with uh, pretty unhappy faces now if you had bought tickets through them recently, I'm sure. Um, but the, one, the reason why I'm here and the reason why I had to share with you is this one. So in the year 2000, how many of you have not seen this? Raise your hand. One person, two, three, okay. Thank you, four, okay. Um, so I'll go very briefly into that and then we'll, we'll talk about the design aspects of it. So in the year 2000, George Bush was running for the president of the United States and Al Gore was running against him. This was the ballot that was used in Palm Beach, Florida. And by looking at this ballot, what we need to understand, this is the ballot that actually won the, won the presidency for Bush because this is what happened. Does this work? Yes. People who were voting for George Bush, okay, what we need to explain is the constraints of this. So the people who are designing the ballot, all they could change are these pieces of paper, this is called a butterfly ballot, because these papers are editable. Whereas the actual hardware, you can see in the middle, there's a yellow strip, which is a card, that is your ballot. And there are metal spines that hold it in place and hold the arms, which is the butterfly wings, potentially here in the ballot. So the only thing they could change are the pages on the outside. The rest is non-negotiable. So to vote here, you have to take a pointy stick and make a hole through one of the openings pointed at by the arrows. So people who were trying to vote for George Bush came in here, saw the arrow, perforated the first hole, and went home. People who wanted to vote for Al Gore came in, saw the, uh, the name, perforated the second hole, some of them stayed around long enough to see that there's an arrow pointing to the second hole and that they had just voted for Pat Buchanan. In which case, some of them proceeded to perforate this, the third hole. And so by having two holes perforated, they invalidated their vote. That happened 2,000 times. No, 20, 20,000 times. And what happens after that is this. Bush won by 537 votes out of 5.8 million. 
19,000 were, were disqualified based on the du duo uh, votes. There was a lawsuit. It took 37 days to decide who was the president. And the lawsuit claimed that the ballots were deceptive, misleading, and confusing. And it, by December 13th, they figured out who the president should be. So this is the story that I've been telling my students for the past 18 years. And we're always looking at this ballot. And my story always goes, well, if they had done a little usability test with, say, 10 participants, and they would have asked people, who would you, how would you vote for Bush? How would you vote for Gore? How would you vote for whatever? It was a kind of usability test we could easily imagine doing. They could have found the problem with that ballot. So I say, how could they be so ignorant and, and try to like shortcut? The, did, was their budget really that tight? So that was my story for the past 18 years. And then at the end of September, there was an event in Toronto called the Elevate Technology Festival, where I was asked to speak. And I gave my keyhole talk. And I met a guy, Al Gore. I met Al Gore, and as I was waiting in line to take this picture, I was happened to be the first in line, and I had my laptop sitting right there, and I had my slides, which had just showed the ballot to my students the night before. I decided, oh, I'm gonna show this to him and tell him, you know, I'm a real fan of yours, and sorry you didn't win, and all that jazz, right? It's kind of social small talk. So I showed him this thing, he comes up, he looks at the laptop, he looks at the screen, and then he goes, they did it on purpose. <laughs> that changed my story. That goes to the, the good design, bad design. Like, was that an evil decision? Imagine if they did do that usability test with 10 participants and discovered that people are actually confused, and then they went ahead anyways, and they could tell by that that Pat Buchanan was going to do really, really well in Florida, even though he never came to visit. He had like five times more votes in that county than anywhere else in Florida. Imagine if that was actually the process that happened behind the scenes. And what would be the consequences of that? So then I did a little bit of research into the cost. So in the past 18 years, after George Bush came to power, the military presence worldwide of the American impact has increased significantly. There are now 76 countries that the US is involved in militarily in various aspects, from drone missiles to uh, exercises to actually having bases at 44 countries. 39% of, of the world now has some kind of interaction with the American military machine. And if we look at the cost of war, this number at the bottom here is $4.6 trillion, is how much has been spent on all the different initiatives in the military sense. And it's a $32.8 million per hour change. Another recent uh, research article I noticed is that it's not just it's not just the pure money, and that's the American taxpayers' money, which is, by the way, going to be $7.9 trillion by the time they're done, and that's just the, the debt. Um, there's also how many cities have been turned into rubble, how many millions of people have been displaced, how many of those millions of people are now refugees and trying to get asylum in countries that don't necessarily want them or welcome them. So what is actually the cost? of a usability problem. And I think this is why I had to be here and to share with you sort of my, uh, well, the, the new light on the battle, uh, on the exercise of the, the ballot design. And look at different simple design alternatives that could have avoided that situation. Here, by providing some shading, it greatly reduces the con confusion of which which perforation would be done by which, for which vote. And here's another one. This is a great one because it's actually from Typography for Lawyers website. And so this is a website that's trying to show the value and the importance of typography in legal situations. And here they've designed, again, following the same constraints, they've designed the butterfly ballot in a way that would fit on two lines, would still give us a larger font size, and yet uh, would reduce the, the confusion and eliminate the, the wrong, ballot, wrong voting situation.
And so that leads us to this concept of dark patterns. How many of you have heard of dark patterns? Most of you, awesome. For those of you who haven't, this is a great uh, place to go and a site that collects information and um, examples of situations where design is used for, for against the intention of the user. And there's a really cool video. If you go to darkpatterns.org, there's a really cool video, which I was going to play for you. But in terms of time, I'm not going to do it. I'll just show you some examples. Here's an example. Um, this is a free Wi-Fi at an airport, except the only way to get free Wi-Fi is you have to subscribe to receive their newsletter and give them your address to spam you. So it's not really free. Another example is, uh, so they have a, a, tw a Twitter feed of all the dark pattern tags. And this one is about notifications that come from apps that have nothing to tell you. They just want your attention. And there's no way to remove the notification. Happens to me sometimes in Slack and other places. It's so annoying. You're trying to figure out why it's still red, but it doesn't go away. This one is a little bit even more, more uh, tricky. The fake notification. So Facebook wants you to accept their terms and conditions. And they want you to do it pretty quickly by showing you that there is red. There's a notification. Somebody wants to tell you something really important and pressing. And the, there's actually nothing there. It's just there to get you past the T's and C's. So you click the Agree button quickly. That's pretty nasty. And our friend Amazon Prime make it really hard for you to get out without accepting the Amazon Prime offer for service. Because the, all the major calls to action are very large, and the one that gives you a bypass the Prime is really small. So here's some different types of dark patterns. And Roach Motel, disguise ads, sneak into basket. We had an example this week in class. Somebody said, I ordered a sweater, but they doubled my order, and I ended up with two of everything. And I called them, and I said, but, but I didn't want the two of everything. And I said, well, sorry, we can't change it now. Sneak in the basket. Um, tricky questions which, where they make the phrasing so complex that you can't even tell, are you subscribing to or against? And credit card rollover. They just charge your card and hope you don't notice. And the friend spam, which uh, LinkedIn actually was sued for forcing people to disclose their friends and spam their friends to join LinkedIn. This was something that they were doing in the beginning, and they cost them $13 million to settle the lawsuit. And, uh, and then they stopped the, the process of, of scraping your contacts list and then spamming your friends with joining LinkedIn invitations. These are the companies who are benefiting from dark patterns, and I'm sure the list is large. And is there any way to sort of avoid it? How do we solve this as, a, as an industry? How do we address it? Well, the UXPA has proposed an ethical uh, conduct, which I think is a, and I, at least a small step in that direction. I think we all need to be sort of more wary of that problem and work towards avoiding some of these bad designs and avoid working for companies that insist that we implement them. That's all for me. I'll say thank you.